Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. It's good to be here this week. I had a beautiful drive in last night and um, just enjoyed getting to see some of the scenery of Wooster, Ohio and its environs. Uh, the sun was setting and I uh, saw a nice little horse and buggy uh, rolling around on my way in and uh, it just reminded me of how, how wonderful it was to be with you a couple of years ago when I was here and and uh, looking forward to this week. Um, <clears throat> I was here two years ago and two years ago, a series called Preaching Jesus and we talked about uh, listening straight from the Gospels. This week's going to be a lot different than two years ago. We're not going to uh, do as much textual study. We're going to do a lot of evidences and so we're going to take a look at some external evidences um, so that we might understand that our faith is consistent um, with with science and is consistent with many of the sciences um, and this is an introductory lesson that we're going to be doing here first off uh, to try to introduce the whole theme and so this will be probably the most Bible you're going to get um, tonight we're going to we're going to end every lesson with Bible um, to try to point out what the the fact that we're confirming what the Bible teaches with our lessons. Um, but this morning will probably be the most biblically based lesson you're going to get in terms of uh, looking at Scripture. Um, <clears throat> take a look at Mark chapter 9 as we start out. Mark chapter 9, and I want to begin by thinking with you, uh, thinking with you a, a text here from the Gospels. Mark chapter 9, it says in verse 20, um, it says in verse 20 that they brought him to him. The him is Jesus. They brought this, this little boy that was having seizures and was foaming at the mouth and gnashing at the teeth and becoming rigid. They brought this boy to Jesus. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 20, it says, When he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So can you imagine just walking into a scene and seeing a little boy who's having a seizure and foaming at the mouth? And so Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it says, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us, the father of the boy says to Jesus. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. In verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that phrase I believe, I want to believe, but help my unbelief. That's really why we're doing what we're doing this week. Because I think we all go through times and moments of doubt, where we struggle to believe, where our faith is attacked, where we, we hear what skeptics are saying, and we struggle sometimes to believe. And, and so we want help. We want to be convinced um, that what we want to believe so badly, that it really is true. And we can have confidence in it. And that's our goal this week. To do that, um, we're going to take a look at a few things. And I'm just going to give you the preview, which you can see on the flyers, which I encourage you to hand out. This is really targeted to not, not just the local group here, but to people outside of these walls. Um, people who do have a hard time believing and are skeptical and have questions. Um, people who are at the college right down the street. Um, students who are getting attacked, perhaps, with their faith and with theories. Um, but we're going to think this morning... Um, in, our, in our worship period about the cosmological and teleological arguments. You'll know more about what that, that means um, as we get into the lesson. Uh, but we're going to take a look at an evidence for God, which is the argument of cosmology, the argument of te teleology. And then also we're going to look at the moral argument for God tonight. Um, what does the, the fact that there is morality say about whether or not there is or is not a God. We're going to get into that more tonight. We're going to take a look at an argument that I think is one of the newer arguments for God. And it's one of the newer arguments for God because it's really become a much stronger argument since the discovery of DNA and the library-like code that exists in DNA. And so that's the information argument for God. We're going to take a look at that Monday night. 
We're going to take a look at a lesson called the God of both Testaments, where, you know, sometimes people say, well, the God of the New Testament seems so much different than the God of the Old Testament. I can believe in the God of the New Testament. I'm not sure if I can believe in the God of the Old Testament. And we're going to take a look at, at that, that idea that sometimes gets presented. I think there's fantastic evidence for the Chinese language and Genesis. There are things about the Bible that are embedded into the Chinese language. Um, and, and this is going to be a very different lesson than anything that you've perhaps heard. Um, there's, not, there's not a whole lot of people that are, that are teaching that lesson, um, but, but I think it's a very interesting lesson and a convincing lesson for, for how the Chinese people and, and their language um, actually, uh, it contains evidences for the stories that we see in uh, the work of Genesis. We're going to tackle a lesson on Thursday night that I don't hear a lot of people teaching about, but some I hear a lot of people attacking the idea of Jonah in the Bible and how could Jonah have been swallowed by this great fish. And so we're just asked the question, is Jonah mythical? Um, we're kind of going to put it back on the skeptics um, with that lesson. And then we'll conclude Friday night with a question, why believe Jesus is the Son of God? We're going to talk about what a lot of people do believe about Jesus. We're going to kind of take a look at, at why what a lot of people think about Jesus really is inconsistent with the evidence. Well, let's get into the lesson here today with the rest of the time that we have. Look forward to talking to you more this week, getting to know you. It's been two years, and that I was here just long enough for a week to get to know your names, and I've been gone just long enough to forget most of your names. Um, and so remind me of your names this week and today. Uh, be gracious to me. My memory is not always great, um, and, and I look forward to, to talking to you more throughout the week and socializing. But let's get into this. Mark chapter 9, as we go back to that text. Mark chapter 9 um, contains some interesting information. It contains an interesting contrast. As you start Mark chapter 9, you actually read about the transfiguration of Jesus. In fact, let me show you this picture for a moment. And this is a picture that's a classical painting painted by Raphael. And at the top of the picture, if you can see that, that's just his artistic version of what the transfiguration might have looked like. But it encapsulates, this entire painting encapsulates the entire scene in Mark 9. So at the top of the painting, you have this rendering of a radiant Jesus who's being transfigured on the mountain, and he's in the presence of Moses and Elijah, if you remember that account. He's there with his three closest apostles. So there's Peter, James, and John just below the, the floating Jesus and Moses and Elijah. It must have been, and as I, as I think about the transfiguration, it's one of the hardest miracles for me to, to picture. And it must have been an amazing miracle. If, if When I get to heaven, if I can have them just reenact that for me somehow, um, that, that'd be a big favor to me because it's just something that in my mind, I, I, I have a hard time imagining it. But I must think it must have made an incredible impression when you look at the reaction of Peter, James, and John upon that mount. And here you are in the presence of other Old Testament greats like Moses and Elijah, and you're being reminded of the Father's great love. It's a scene of glory. It's a scene of majesty. But then you look at the bottom of Raphael's painting, and it's the scene that Jesus has to face after he comes down from the mountaintop. And it depicts a dispute that's taking place between the scribes and the disciples of Jesus. And then on the side, if you take a look over here, there's the father with the little boy who foams at the mouth and convulses that we read about when we started our lesson. He's possessed with a demon. It convulses him. It seizes him into epileptic fits and until he foams at the mouth. And this boy is in physical torment. The father is in emotional and spiritual torment, worrying about his son. The disciples, they're frustrated because they can't help the boy, and that's why they have to bring the boy to Jesus. The scribes are using that moment to insult the disciples. They're scoffing at the power of the disciples of Jesus and, and the apostles' inability. So really, at the bottom of the mountain, you have a scene of sadness, of sickness, of strife, a scene of sin. Now imagine coming down from the mountaintop of glory, you're Jesus, and you're facing this scene of sorrow. You know, if you were Jesus, you may have just wanted to just run back up the mountain, like, oh boy, 
now I have to deal with all of this. You know, my, the Father in heaven was just speaking to me, was just telling me that I'm his pride and joy. Um, I was just there with Moses and Elijah. Um, I, I was just being glorified in radiant glory, and now here I am with this, this messed up world. Raphael, um, the, the pulpit commentary kind of describes this contrast that Raphael paints and that we see. It says this in the pulpit commentary. It says, we can scarcely imagine a greater contrast than that which is here presented in Mark 9. You have the tranquility of the one, the tumult of the other, the calm repose of the one, the unrest of the other, the blessedness of the one, the distress of the other, the gladness of the one, the sadness of the other, the glory of the one, the gloominess of the other, the heavenly quietude of the one, the unseemly wrangling of the other, the happiness of the one, the misery of the other, the ecstatic rapture of the one, the excruciating pain of the other, the confidence and comfort of the one, the disputatious unbelief of the other. The contrast was just that which we can conceive to exist between the holiness of heaven and the sinfulness of earth. Now, you think for a moment about Jesus, who's just heard the Father exclaim from the heavens, this is my beloved Son, hear him. And then a few moments later, after the time where God the Father says, hear my Son Jesus, world, the world needs to hear him. A few moments later, you have this concerned father who says to Jesus, look at Mark 9, 22, and notice the word if. He says to Jesus, if you can do anything, you're speaking to Jesus, the son of God, the great miracle worker, the one the whole world needs to hear. And you're saying, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So you imagine that, that God in heaven just speaking to Jesus and yet a lowly human being isn't sure if Jesus can really do anything to help the boy. And the boy's father cries out, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. How many of us have been or are in the shoes of this father? You know, we have our mountaintop moments of faith and we, we wish we could be confident and bold. But as we see the affliction of this world and everything that goes on in it, it's hard not to get rattled sometimes. We want to live on the mountaintop where, where faith seems so easy for some people. But the truth is that we live down below where faith can sometimes be so difficult. We question why people get so dangerously sick we question why is it that it seems like we're praying for something but our our prayers don't seem to have any avail we wonder why god won't help ease the heartbreak that we feel in this broken world and then to make matters worse we have the scribes of this world who like to point fingers at us and criticize and tear down our faith until we want to cry out help my unbelief i'm having a hard time have you been there and have you questioned because I can tell you I've been there it, it's 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 been a struggle for me especially when I was a, a teenager and as I was younger faith was a struggle for me and I and I longed for evidence proof you know help my unbelief um, I've been waiting for someone, I think when I was younger especially, to, to come along out of the crowd of people who are fighting about faith to offer some real proof and some real evidence to give credibility and confidence to my faith in God and in His Word and, and in His Son. And if you've struggled with that and wrestled with that, I'm going to tell you that you're not alone because doubts at times arise in the mind of almost every Christian. Doubts have arisen in the hearts and minds of some of the greatest men of faith. God doesn't expect you to believe everything without question. We are actually called to test what we hear so that we might have confidence in it and we might believe it. 
our belief has to be more reasonable and rational than our unbelief or we're not going to believe and so in this lesson what I just simply want to do with our, our short time we have left is I want to consider a few of the characters who are really considered strong characters of Scripture but they went through moments of unbelief and doubt and struggle to get there and I want you to think about God's response to their questions let's start in the Old Testament with Gideon Gideon lived at a time when the Midianites were oppressing the people of Israel. And Gideon asks an interesting question in Judges 6 and verse 13. This is when you know, the angel of the Lord tells Gideon that he has a special mission. And Gideon responds with this question. He says, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? interesting question isn't it you say the Lord is with us you're telling me to go do something on behalf of the Lord you want me to go defeat the Midianites who are oppressing the people of Israel but if the Lord is with us then why have all these bad things been happening people ask questions like that today right it's a popular question you know why would a God a good God why would he allow evil that's a question that people ask in our world Epicurus asked a similar form of question. Epicurus is the, the founder of the Epicurean philosophy. And Paul actually dealt with the Epicureans and Stoics in Acts chapter 17. Well, what do the Epicureans believe? Well, Epicurus once said this. He said, either God wants to abolish evil and cannot, or he can, but he doesn't want to, or he cannot, and he doesn't want to. If God wants to abolish evil but can't do it, then he is impotent. He's an impotent God, was Epicurus' conclusion. He says, but if he can abolish evil and he doesn't want to, then he's wicked. But if God can and wants to abolish evil, then how come there is evil in the world? This is a similar question to what Gideon's asking. Why are these evil things happening to us if God is with us? Why hasn't he done something about it? Well, you know, what you're going to see in this story is, well, that's why God's putting you to work, Gideon, because he's trying to use you to, to accomplish this. But these questions that people ask suggest that, that we're doubting God. And I think it's important to point out about Gideon because sometimes I, I don't like how we've taught Gideon in Bible classes and, and in churches sometimes. We, we paint him as if he were this mighty, brave hero who never struggled and he was always confident. But the truth is about Gideon that when God first tasked him with his mission, he was a doubting coward. He asked the question, first of all, in Judges chapter 6 and verse 13, Oh, my Lord, if, if the Lord is with, with us, why has all this happened to us? But you can look at other instances as well. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 15, in Judges 6 and verse 15, the angel of the Lord says, I want you to go. And he responds and says, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? He's not confident. He's not bold. He's not courageous. He's asking the question, How can I save Israel? And he says, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I come from a weak family. I'm from a family of weaklings. You know? And he says, and I am the least in my father's house. I am the weaklingest of the weaklings in my family. Why do you expect me to do this? The angel reassures Gideon. And then Gideon responds in Judges 6 and verse 17. If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. So he's like, I'm still not convinced that I need to go do what you're telling me to do. I'd like a sign. Most people praise Gideon for his courage, for his faith, for his role, because he's a deliverer of God's people. But he starts out, what I want you to see, he is an unsure, timid, and scared skeptic. He asks for no less than three signs. God doesn't just give him one. God gives him three signs. Remember the... The, the fleece was supposed to be wet and the rest of the ground was supposed to be dry. Then he says, well, reverse it, God, if you're God. Then the rest of the ground was supposed to be wet and the fleece was going to be dry. Um, and, and so he wants multiple signs so that he might be convinced to do what God is calling him to do. And here's what I want you to see in this whole story. God does not dismiss Gideon's questions. God does not deny Gideon the answers that he wants. God provides proof 
for Gideon through these signs and through evidence so that he can be more confident in what God called him to do. Before Gideon became the confident warrior that we sometimes remember him as, he had to go through the struggle of faith. And God gave him the evidence that he needed. Let me give you another example, John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist, he preaches this message of repentance. We think of him as this very bold guy who's out there, you know, um, wearing this very different type of clothing and out there eating locusts and wild honey, a wilderness man, just kind of a tough preacher. But John the Baptizer had his moments of doubt. You know, after the arrest of John the Baptist, John sends his disciples to ask a, a head-scratching question. And the question recorded in Luke 7 and verse 19 is this. John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now that's an interesting question coming from John the Baptizer. You know, I, I would have to think that when Jesus heard that question, he would have to do a double take. You know, like, who asked that question? The prophet who prepared the way for me? The prophet that Isaiah 40 was predicting for years? The prophet who was the Elijah who was to come? The bold, fearless, strong John? My cousin? He's asking if I'm the coming one? And maybe Jesus is thinking to himself, you know, if he's doubting, then maybe I'm not doing a very good job of persuading people of who I am. Are you sure that it's John who asked that question? Are you the coming one? I mean, your job, John, was to prepare the way for the coming one. That was your job. Of course I'm the coming one. That's, that's why you've been doing what you're doing. But it's understandable why John would ask that question. He's in prison. He's being unjustly persecuted. He has the prospect of death ahead of him. And John wants to make sure that he's not been living for a lie. I think sometimes why, that's why we ask this question. I'm going to spend my entire life serving Jesus. I want to make sure, and, I, and, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to be criticized for serving Jesus. People are going to put me down. Some people are going to mock me because of my faith. I want to make sure that what I'm believing and who I'm serving, he's real. I want to make sure that I'm not believing a lie. And that's what John wants. John wants reassurance. Jesus doesn't belittle John. And I think that's important. Jesus does not belittle John for his questions. And he doesn't belittle him for his doubts. He helps reassure him. There is a difference. I do want to say this between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is an affliction of the mind. And the mind can be changed. Sometimes we have doubt, and, 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 and the mind can be changed when it comes to our doubt. Unbelief is often a problem of the heart, and it affects the will. Doubt may just be a sign that a person is thinking, and a person needs reassurance. That's where John is. John is in the position of doubt when we come across him in Luke 7, or in Matthew 11, or Mark 6. All these texts relay this, this event. Why is it that we might have doubt, moments of doubt? Well, the child of God who's suffering from a terminal illness, they may need to be reassured that God is going to keep his promises and that death is not a time where we're leaving the land of the living. No, it's where we're leaving the land of the dying so we can be in the land of the living. And people need reassured of that sometimes. The born-again Christian who is sacrificing his old life for the sake of a new one. That's a big decision for a born-again Christian who's not been raised in a Christian home, maybe. They need to know when they face persecution and trials in the process, they need to be reassured this is the right decision. You've made the right decision. And the individual like John who preaches and stands for the truth of God and suffers for it. And there are people who are trying to preach in countries that are very inimical to Christianity. There are people who are serving in cities here in the U.S. that are becoming extremely inimical. You can just go up north to Canada and there's certain things that you can't preach or teach without being accused of a hate crime. And you can get yourself in big trouble when, you're, when you try to say certain things that the Bible says just going a little bit up north. 
Well, when you're going through that as a preacher and a teacher of God's word and you're standing for the truth and you're suffering for it, you need to be reassured that Jesus is a king that is far greater than any earthly potentate or judge. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves as, as we go through these moments of doubt is are you searching for answers to your questions? Are you sincerely searching for answers to your questions or are you searching for justifications and excuses for your unbelief. And one of the overlooked points that we may miss is how John, he goes straight to the source, Jesus Christ, for the answers. And Jesus willingly responds. Do you notice what Jesus says? He tells the disciples of John, he says, Go and tell John. What's he want him to tell him? Well, tell him the miracles that you've seen. Tell them the wonders that you've seen, that the poor have the gospel preached to them. Tell, them, tell John of these things. It's important to note, though, that John does not go to other doubters. This is such a key point. It's a key point for, for my kids. I've got a 16-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 20-year-old. And they see all kinds of stuff. If you're on social media, most kids, teens, college-age kids, they are. If you're seeing stuff on social media, you're seeing Christianity get attacked, you're seeing faith get attacked, you're seeing belief in God get attacked. And, and one of the biggest problems, I think, of our, our younger culture today sometimes is that we're going to other doubters, we're going to other skeptics, we're going to scoffers, we're going to ex-disciples looking for answers. And we make a huge mistake if we're searching for blessed assurance from the unassured. The blessed man does not seek counsel from the ungodly. Psalm chapter 1 says that. If you want to be blessed, you, you don't listen to the ungodly. That's not where you're going to find the answers you're, you need. Sometimes I wonder if we're actually looking for a way out. We're looking for an excuse. We're looking for a justification to jump ship. John goes straight to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, can, can you give me proof? Are you the coming one? Or should we look for somebody else? And notice what Jesus immediately does. He performs miracles right there in the presence of John's messengers. And he says to the messengers, go back and tell John what you've seen so that he has the evidence that he needs. Jesus and his witnesses provide the evidence for our doubts. And so we have to search the records to regain confidence. Ask people of faith who have done these types of searches as well. Read the books from men who have changed and gone from unbelief to belief. There are very smart men who have done that very thing. We're going to be quoting from a lot of them this week, actually. Lee Strobel was an atheist. He wrote the case for a creator. He wrote the case for Christ and became a believer in Christ. Francis Collins writes a book called The Language of God. He's the guy that did the research on DNA itself. And he's a believer that there is a God. Uh, C.S. Lewis was an unbeliever, taught at Oxford. He became a believer. The moral argument that we're studying tonight is really, um, he, he did a great job in mere Christianity writing about that. Read from people who have gone from unbelief to belief and, and read the reasons why that they have changed their mind. Find your answers from some of those people and you'll find encouragement in that. Let me notice a couple more examples with you from Scripture of people who struggled and had their struggles. Thomas is another one. Thomas often gets a bad rap. We call him Doubting Thomas. But we forget about a couple of things with Thomas. For, for example, we forget before he was Doubting Thomas, he was actually very courageous Thomas. In John chapter 11 and verse 16, Jesus was going to head down to Jerusalem. All the disciples were very hesitant to do so. But Thomas is the one in John 11 verse 16 who says to the other disciples, let us go there also that we may die with him. Thomas was ready for, to die for Jesus. He loved Jesus. He loved Jesus zealously. He loved him boldly. But it's clear that when Jesus finally dies, Thomas is deeply wounded. He is hurt. He feels very hopeless. He's lost his leader. And we read in the passage where Thomas gets his negative nickname, you know, Doubting Thomas. We read it from John chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. And in John chapter 20, 24 and 25, that's where Jesus says, or Thomas says about Jesus. He says, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve. He was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. 
They know that Thomas is discouraged. He's struggling in his faith. He's just very depressed in this moment because this is a week after Jesus has gone to the cross. And they tell Jesus, we've seen him. You know, cheer up, buddy. You know, <laughs> Jesus is alive. This is good news. And Thomas is still just like, that, that can't happen. Jesus being, he, I saw him on the cross. We all saw him. We all know that he died. And so Thomas says this, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He's really struggling here. And that's where he gets his nickname. His words come from a wounded heart. He's defensive. He's pessimistic. He's challenging. There's just some things, some claims about Jesus. He's having a hard time wrapping his head around. I mean, yes, it, it's hard to wrap your head around somebody that's dead. And he's alive again three days later. But thankfully, Jesus takes Thomas up on the challenge. And this is what I want you to see about all of these examples. God never says, shame on you for not believing I'm not giving you any more evidence. No, Jesus takes Thomas up and he offers to show him the evidence that he desires when he comes into that room to make another resurrection appearance. He allows Thomas the chance to examine the evidence for himself and he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Go ahead and put your finger into the print of the nails. Go ahead and put your hand into my side and don't be unbelieving, but believing. He gives him every chance to examine it. And after examining the evidence, Thomas's belief is reignited in the risen Christ. So he really shouldn't be called Doubting Thomas. He's Believing Thomas now. That nickname needs to be shed. Don't you hate it when people give you nicknames from some bad experience you had from years ago? That's not me anymore, okay? Give me a new nickname, guys. Um, that's not the person that I am anymore. Some people just need to be reassured that there's evidence. And Thomas was one of those people. And I just want to say, let's not give up on the Thomas-like personalities of this world. Don't give up on them. Give them the evidence that they need. Let them know. Let them be reassured. Well, there's one more that I'll finish up with you, and that is Paul. That is Paul. Some in their unbelief, they just cower away and quietly go about their own lives, like Thomas. But some, like Paul, feel compelled to punish and threaten believers as... Um, uh, to, to intimidate them. And that was Paul. Paul's holding the coats of murderers in Acts chapter 7. Um, he's putting Christians in prison. He's casting his vote against them, having them put to death. And so when Ananias is called to go teach Paul, Ananias is very afraid in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. He's like, hold on. Are you sure this is the person that you want me to teach? Because I've heard some bad things about this guy. He really doesn't like Christians. But an appearance from the resurrected Jesus helped Paul be brought to his knees and caused one of the most incredible life changes that's ever been witnessed. And Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now what's interesting about Paul, just in summary, because I'm running out of time, but before Jesus Christ, Paul wanted to kill Christians. But after the appearance of Jesus Christ, Paul was willing to die for Jesus. Now, why did God want Paul so badly? The reason why God wanted Paul so badly, Paul says, is because he wanted Paul to be the blueprint for every believer after that. For people who struggle with their faith and with their conviction, so for people who even hate God and hate Jesus and hate the things of God, God wanted Paul to be the blueprint for every person so they could have hope that if Paul changed, you can change too. And if Paul could be saved, the chief of sinners, you can be saved too. Paul wasn't just a one-off convert. His conversion wasn't a one-time only event. God wanted Paul to be the example for many others who would follow. Evidence can change hearts, can change minds, and can change lives. Now, why am I passionate about evidences? Well, how many of you can see yourselves at one point or another as, as one of these characters that we've talked about today? You've had your Gideon moments of questioning the character of God. You've had your John moments where you've been questioning whether Jesus is truly who he claims to be and who the Bible claims he is. You've had your Thomas moments where you felt kind of defeated and 
wanted to be convicted about the one whom you have believed. And maybe you've even had your Paul moments where you talk bad about God's people and you've talked bad about the church and you've even been persecuted and mocked Christians. I'm going to tell you something. I've been there too. And when I was a younger teenager, I questioned the teachings of my upbringing. I wondered if what I'd been taught about God and about Jesus Christ and about the Bible, whether it could be validated. I got discouraged when I saw that there seemed to be so few believers and so many mockers. And I even went through stages where I just thought Christians, they're just a bunch of silly killjoys who didn't want anybody to have fun. And they're just blindly following what they've been taught by tradition. But one day I was confronted with evidence. I listened to sermons about the evidences that we have for the people, for the places, for the events of the scriptures. And I was convicted. And I love searching out the evidences, studying the evidences, preaching on the evidences, because there's evidence for what we believe. There's proof so that we might believe beyond a reasonable doubt. And God uses the rational process of logic and reason to help us to see that we're not believing a lie. But God, His Son, His Word, its promises, they are a reality. The evidence isn't hidden. Books upon books, lectures upon lectures, defense upon defense have been made to help us know the evidences for our faith. And so my hope for you this week, we're really just touching the hem of the garment when it comes to evidences, by the way. I've got like 50 sermons on evidences. I'm presenting eight to you this week. But my hope this week is that you'll honestly listen and examine and use these evidences to become convicted and courageous in the defense of the truth. I know that many of you, you want to believe and the people that, that you know want to believe. And I just want you to know that the Lord can help your unbelief. And I hope that we, we accomplish some of that this week. So thanks for your attention this morning. Look forward to our next lesson.